Hello and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am the host for the show. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. We are very fortunate and pleased to have as my guest today Judge Michael Ponzor, U.S. District Court Judge. He went from Harvard to being a Rhodes Scholar to eventually being a lawyer and a judge, and we're going to talk about some of those things. In addition, um, uh, Judge Ponzer is a New York Times best-selling author. One of the things we're also going to talk about is Judge Ponzer uh, presided over a case that hadn't been heard in Massachusetts in 50 years. Judge, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's terrific to be here. Thank you very much. So I wanted to just uh, for a moment start in this early years, so to speak, mm -hmm. Uh, but I was kind of interested of what you did when you were a very young child at nine years old. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, when I was uh, very uh, young, uh, I, I think I probably set a record for nerdliness. I was a, <laughs> a skinny, bookish boy of eight or nine years old. And some or, for reason or another, I got it in my mind that uh, I wanted to be a lawyer at that age. And uh, I, I mentioned it to a neighbor and he said, oh, well, you want to you want to go to Harvard then, they have a really good law school. So I went back home and I got out my piece of paper and uh, at age uh, eight or nine I, I wrote a, a letter to Harvard Law School in closing my elementary school grades and saying that uh, I was going to be applying someday and look forward to it. And um, I actually got a letter back from the registrar, which I think was a very generous thing for him to do, in which he said that they, they uh, looked forward one day to entertaining my application. And I had never heard the word entertained used in that way before and was uh, puzzled by it at first. So yeah, I started young. So as things moved on, even though you had um, uh, done some work in art in, in terms of your college career, mm -hmm. obviously you, you did uh, move forward with your desire to be a lawyer. Correct. Uh, and you uh, served as a lawyer in private practice for quite a long time, mm -hmm. and also uh, served as a law clerk to Judge Toro. Yes. Tell me a little bit about him. Was yeah. Well, I had a, uh, uh, a, a, for a little while there, I kind of veered off my law track and uh, thought I might want to be an English professor, but uh, uh, two years at Oxford was long enough to disabuse me of that. And I came back and went to law school, and uh, one of the things uh, that uh, law students, uh, many law students like to do and still like to do is to clerk for a federal judge for a year or two after they get out of law school. It gives you a kind of frontline in the trenches experience of sitting in the courtroom, uh, watching trials, seeing other lawyers perform. And I was very fortunate to uh, clerk for a, a, a judge who sadly just died about uh, a month ago, maybe two months ago now, named Joseph Toro. Uh, T-A-U-R-O, and he was uh, uh, new on the bench, had only been on for like four years when I clerked for him, and we tried a lot of cases, and he became very dear to me. Uh, and um, for a long time, I was uh, terrifically in awe of him. He was a mentor, and then eventually, uh, he became a colleague because he was the chief judge of the court when I became a U.S. District Court judge, and he swore me in. Well, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, in order to be a law clerk, do you apply to yes. the judge? Yes. You, uh, you uh, 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 s submit your applications, the judge does the interviews, and in the case of uh, U.S. District Court judges, there are two law clerks that uh, each judge has, generally. Um, the law clerks in my novels are pretty important characters, yes, and the are. relationship between a judge and his or her law clerks is uh, almost like a parent and child relationship. You develop a just a tremendous fondness for your law clerks. Ne never mind how much you learn from a man like that, to say the least. Yes. Oh, absolutely. He was, he was incredible. I, mean, I learned about the law, but I also learned about um, being an adult in the world and uh, how you live a good life and uh, how you live an ethical, uh, act as an ethical judge. And he, he really uh, taught me that. Sounds like that part about being ethical is the key to and it should be the key to any judge. Yes, who does yes, that. it is, and it's a, it's quite, it's it, it's a, in some ways more challenging than you might think. Of course, there are specific ethical rules that you can follow, and they provide the framework of how you should behave as a judge. But uh, your your demeanor in the courtroom, your courtesy to people, 
uh, your generosity to uh, the lawyers who are appearing before you and to the litigants, uh, your uh, empathy for people who may be coming into the courtroom and be very uh, frightened or at least uncomfortable. Sure. Uh, the, the task of being an, a, an ethical, humane, compassionate judge is uh, quite subtle in some ways. Interesting, to say the least. Yeah. I realize that you've taught at Western uh, New England School of Law, and yeah. it's been going on for quite a while. I, I haven't uh, taught there. I've, I stopped teaching there a few, a few years back, but okay. I taught there for many, many years. I taught a, a, a class uh, in, in, in the night uh, uh, session of the law school, uh, uh, usually in the uh, spring semester, called Civil Litigation in the Pretrial Phase. And it was a seminar uh, for a limited number of students, and it was just intensive work on arguing motions uh, and uh, learning to do good, solid oral and written advocacy. I loved it. The law students were so um, full of uh, optimism and positive energy, and um, they uh, all were just terrific. I, I really liked my time teaching. and I, I taught for quite a long time, more than 15 years, right. but I stepped away from it a few years back. Okay. I also taught at Yale, same class, mm -hmm. and I taught for three years as an adjunct at the University of uh, Massachusetts as well, teaching undergraduates. Uh, Very interesting to say yeah. the least. So, my understanding is you were a magistrate judge, U.S. District Court magistrate judge, right. from approximately 84 to 94. 94. Yep. So, number one, how does one become a judge? All right. But what really is a magistrate judge? And I know once you did that, you moved on to be a U.S. District Court judge. Right. So maybe you could sort of take us through the steps and how that, uh, that happened. Sure. Um, a magistrate judge is a sort of a subordinate federal judge who handles, uh, on the criminal side, uh, preliminary things. Um, Roger Stone, for example, who we've seen in the news, yes. was brought before a person who happened to be a friend of mine named Lorana Snow, who's a magistrate judge in Florida. And she uh, had him come before her, and she set bail for him. She informed him of his charges. She co confirmed whether he was going to be retaining his own lawyer or would be getting an appointed lawyer. And the, the magistrate judge is sort of at the front door of the process, doing the preliminary things in uh, in criminal cases. They'll also take applications for search warrants uh, and, and so on. On the civil side, the magistrate judge's powers are uh, potentially equivalent to the district court judge's powers because parties can say, well, I think we'll let the magistrate judge take our case, and they can consent to that. If they don't consent to it, then the case automatically goes to the U.S. District Court judge. Now, would this uh, magistrate judge actually be the judge for the case, or did it get passed on? Now? It'll get passed on to a U.S. District Court judge. So, the magistrate judge Snow will handle the preliminary matters, yep. and then it will go to uh, be assigned to some other U.S. District Court judge. I imagine the judge will be in New York. I think that maybe where, or possibly Washington. I can't mm -hmm. remember where the charges actually were filed, right. uh, but he was arrested in Florida process there, and then he'll be brought before the district court judge. The process of getting to be a magistrate judge is different from the process of being a U.S. district court judge. Magistrate judges serve for eight-year terms. They are selected by the district court judge. That is, the judges on the next echelon up get together and say, we need a magistrate judge here, and they solicit applications, interview the applicants, and choose somebody to be a magistrate judge. And I was chosen in 1984 to be the magistrate judge, the first magistrate judge here in western Massachusetts um, by the judges at that time sitting in the District of Massachusetts. They called me into Boston for an interview. It's very intimidating. They're all sitting around the table. <laughs> right. uh, and um, uh, I, I was uh, blessed to be selected and really loved it. I loved practicing law. I loved being a lawyer in, uh, in Amherst. I started off uh, wanting to be Perry Mason and be a, a criminal defense lawyer. And as my career evolved, I decided I'd rather be Atticus Finch right. from To Kill a Mockingbird and I be a small town that. lawyer right. with lots of uh, clients that were my neighbors. And I was, and I enjoyed it. But I have to say, I've really taken to uh, judging uh, even more. So I did that kind of preliminary work and quite a lot of civil work for 10 years. And then Frank Friedman, uh, who 
uh, was the U.S. District Court judge in Western Massachusetts stepped down, and that position opened up, and I applied for it. Uh, and and obviously, you got the job. I did, and that process was quite different. Uh, and that is a presidential appointment recommended by the senators from your home state. Senator Kennedy uh, was uh, very, uh, very uh, efficient uh, in the way he handled this. There were a number of openings in Massachusetts. He set up an interview panel of very prominent uh, lawyers and um, had people apply. There were almost 100 applications for the five vacancies at that time, and the interview panel whittled them down to 10 for five positions, and Senator Kennedy um, interviewed every applicant before making his decision about the five that he was going to send to President Clinton. So Clinton was the one who actually oh. signed off on right. it. Right. He appointed end. me. I've got a, a, my uh, commission signed by uh, William Jefferson Clinton on the wall in my, right. uh, my chambers in, in Springfield. So now you're a U.S. District Court judge. And Correct. You obviously see a variety of cases, to say the least. Yeah. But one case in particular I want to talk to you about, right. and that was uh, a case that was a death penalty case mm -hmm. that had not been heard in Massachusetts in about 50 years. Yes. And did I get it right that you were a relatively new judge at the time? Well, I had been a U.S. District Court judge for uh, uh, about five years okay. when the indictment came down. I started in 94. And uh, the, the indictment came down in 98 or 99. It went to trial in the fall of 2000. And it, it, it was the first death penalty case, the first capital case, the first case where a person's life was going to be on the line in Massachusetts for more than 50 years. Um, uh, the uh, trial involved, uh, some people may remember it, it was in the papers a lot back in 2000 and the lead up to the trial involved a, a nurse named Kristen Gilbert who was accused of murdering her patients at the VA Medical Center in Leeds just west of Northampton. So that was a, a, a real shock for me. I, I never thought I'd get a death penalty case. Most uh, federal judges don't. Um, uh, but it, it landed in my lap and you take what comes in and you, uh, you handle it. And uh, it was uh, um, a, a, a tremendously powerful sort of professional challenge, uh, a moral challenge, and to some extent an emotional challenge for, for me as the judge and for everybody that's involved in the process. Can you talk a little bit more about the case specifically, about sure. how that proceeded and how it finally got to its end conclusion at some point, if you don't mind sure. talking about um, that? Sure. The case uh, was a death penalty case. Um, because it was a federal case. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, I think wisely, does not have a death penalty. Uh, the, the life in prison without hope of parole is, this, is, is the most uh, harsh sentence that a judge in the state court can impose. Um, but uh, Congress in Washington has enacted a death penalty statute, and because Ms. Gilbert was accused of murdering people at a Veterans Administration hospital, the court had jurisdiction over that case, and they could seek the death penalty. And she was charged with um, being on the night shift and coming into the uh, rooms of her patients. And um, some people who've been in the hospital will have had this experience. They put something in your arm sometimes when you're in the hospital for a while called a HEPLOC. It's like a device that allows them to start intravenous fluids uh, or medication uh, without having to find a vein. It's always sort of there and available. But it gets clogged and needs to be rinsed out from time to time with saline. And she would come in and say, uh, I need to rinse your Heplock out with saline. And it would be in the middle of the night, uh, not no one around other than her. And instead of giving them saline, she would give them a massive dose of epinephrine, which is synthetic adrenaline, which would trigger a, a cardiac arrhythmia and the person would die often very quickly, of a heart attack as a result of this injection. Um, so she was charged with um, deliberately murdering four of her patients and attempting to murder three of her other patients. Did it ever come out, or did you ever uh, uh, understand about the trial, what motivated? No, there was a, the, the government's theory was, was that she uh, 
was doing this to show off for a, uh, a, a security guard who uh, she was having an affair with. Now, this case had everything. It uh, certainly it, sounds uh, like it, yes, Sex it and violence. Yes. Uh, she was married, she had two children, and she was uh, involved with this uh, other person, and uh, he was a security guard, and they, uh, their um, theory was that she was doing this to show off for him because it would create a crisis and she could intervene and sometimes save people or sometimes not, and the melodrama was very exciting for her. And the government's position was she became um, uh, what they called a code bug, the way some kids become firebugs. Because when somebody goes into crisis, there's a code, and there's a code cart, and there's right. an announcement that goes out over the uh, all over the hospital, and people come pouring into the room to try and save the person's life. And according to the government, they felt she became kind of addicted to this kind of uh, right. uh, melodrama and uh, kept doing it. Um, somebody found out. Yeah, eventually, eventually. Uh, the, the, there were suspicions. Uh, and she, the, the, the focus uh, very quickly uh, was on her. And uh, things went on from there. And the, the, the jury, uh, it was a long case. It took us a month to pick the jury. <clears throat> we had to interview each juror uh, individually to find out his or her feelings about the death penalty, um, whether they could sit on the trial, uh, whether they had been influenced by pretrial publicity because there was a ton of it. Sure. Uh, and uh, that process was one juror at a time until we had... Uh, uh, 18 uh, jurors, 12 for the uh, panel that would be deciding, and then six alternates. And then the case was tried for uh, four months after that, uh, over the winter of the end of 2000 and into 2001. And in the end, they, they found her guilty of all the charges, essentially. And, um, and then we went into the second phase of the trial. Uh, death penalty trials have two segments, the guilt phase, when the jury decides whether the government has proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, and the penalty phase, where the uh, jury decides whether the person should be executed. And they, what do they decide? They, they decide that they would not execute her. Uh, under our system, it's required that the verdict be unanimous. All 12 people have to agree before a person can be executed. If even one person disagrees, and in this case, I think about half of the jury uh, felt that the death penalty would be excessive, and they uh, d uh, decided they would not execute her, uh, vote to execute her, and so she automatically got a life sentence without hope of parole, and she's now in Texas at a high security right. facility there. Uh, I want to move on. Okay. You are a author, and uh, quite yeah. an author. Yeah. The book, The Hanging Judge, is a New York Times bestseller, yep. and having read the book, I concur. <laughs> it was a terrific book, and uh, I had kind of mentioned a little bit that um, I was reading the book, and we're kind of getting towards the end, and all of a sudden I get hit with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. This whole twist and turn at the end was really something, and it was really, really great to the book. Great. Talk about this a little bit. I, I know that... Um, uh, writing something like The Hanging Judge or your other book, The One-Eyed Judge, mm -hmm. comes from your experience for sure. Yep. Um, maybe you could just talk about that a little bit, and then I want you to read something from uh, The Hanging Judge, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I, I have this uh, uh, weave in my life uh, between my work as a, uh, as a judicial officer, a magistrate judge and a district court judge, but also a, a, a great interest in literature. I was an English major, sure. I studied uh, English literature at Oxford, and very early on I thought, you know, I can, I can, I can write a novel. And I, 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 I wrote a, a novel when I was uh, in England, uh, and I had an agent, uh, but they were not able to find a publisher for me. And then I kept at it over the years and, and uh, knocked off three or four other partial drafts and one full draft of a novel, was never able to uh, get it sold. When I I had this experience of, of, of presiding at a death penalty trial. I thought, I'd really like to try fiction again, and really intensely. And I uh, wrote um, Saturday and Sunday mornings from 8 in the morning till about till lunchtime, 12, 30, 1 o'clock, every day, and did not allow myself to get distracted. And in eight years, I produced a book. Yes, you did. Uh, and it, it was eventually called The Hanging Judge. 
And it's about a judge uh, who sits in Springfield. I've named him David Norcross. Um, I, uh, I, I stole uh, the name of Emily Dickinson's mother's maiden name and borrowed that um, <laughs> as a bouquet to my hometown of Amherst. <laughs> Uh, and so his name is Judge Norcross. He's originally from Wisconsin. He's been on the bench for just a short period of time. And he draws a death penalty case, which is a, a, a arises, as you know, from a drive-by shooting yes. uh, in Holyoke. My hope in writing the novel, well, my first hope was just to tell a good story that people would be willing to invest their time in reading. And I, I hope it would be engaging enough for that. But I also wanted to take people and bring them up on the bench let them see what I see and hear what I hear uh, sitting up there and get a sense of what the challenges are. Every job has its challenges. I, I don't think the judges are in any way special that way, but every, judge, every, every job has its own unique types of challenges, and that's the kind of thing that I wanted to try to convey. Well, so, after having read your book, I'm ready to be a judge. I have, <laughs> I have the background now. Good. Good. <laughs> I'm teasing you. So please, do, sure. do read a little bit. Well, here's a short passage. This is from the very beginning of The Hanging Judge. Right. Uh, uh, the first uh, scene is a, is a prologue, uh, which is a, a, a dri describes the drive-by shooting, which later drives the whole uh, criminal prosecution. And then we um, uh, peel away from the drive-by shooting, and the first chapter uh, has the reader coming onto the uh, uh, bench uh, with uh, Judge Norcross, and Norcross is reflecting that he's just about to impose sentence on someone, and with this sentence he is going to have imposed 1,000 years of prison sentences on people in about two years on the bench. And he's reflecting to himself, and this is where uh, we pick up. After 1,000 years, he had assumed by now this would be getting easier. He'd assumed wrong. Fate had reserved an especially grim task for the judge this morning. The alleged crack dealer he was sentencing was an obese kid in his mid-twenties with a thin ponytail and a spatter of acne across his forehead. Unlike most defendants, however, this one was quite possibly innocent. Certainly, if the case had been tried to him and not to a jury, Judge Norcross would have found a reasonable doubt and acquitted the man. But the eight women and four men who made up the jury had believed the government's informant, apparently, and Norcross's hands were tied. The defendant was hunched over the counsel table, bouncing his shoulders and knees as though he were chilly. Was he okay? He seemed to sense the judge's concern and looked up. Their eyes met for a bottomless instant, and the young man squared himself and nodded. He was not going to fall apart. So uh, that's uh, how it feels uh, to be in the courtroom. I, I go on from there to describe the young man's mother and girlfriend sitting in the courtroom, and his mother breaks down as he's receiving this mandatory life sentence um, for uh, distribution of crack cocaine. Um, and this relationship that you have um, as a judge to the defendant that you're sentencing uh, is very important. Our, our system of justice is dependent upon a person in the judge's role and relating uh, in real time uh, in the presence of the person and making decisions about the person. And it's very, uh, very intense. And the, the judge is concerned that this guy is going to lose it in the courtroom. Uh, and sometimes that happens. And so you're watching very carefully, and, you're, and he's also watching what else is going on in the courtroom. When you're on the bench, you feel 100% alive. You're aware of so many things. Who's coming into the courtroom? Who's those lawyers talking to each other? Can the jury hear what they're saying? Time for lunch. Juror number three is falling asleep again. Uh, there's a question coming up, which I think is going to be an objection from the other side. How am I going to rule on it? And your mind is just whizzing along. And so I wanted to try to bring the reader into the judge's head and also into the physical realm that the judge looks at when he's doing his job. Uh, I know the defense attorney, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Redpath, mm -hmm. uh, who was, I thought, in your book, quite a good defense attorney. Yes, yes. 
and in real life, sad to say, he passed away. Yes, yes. Uh, He's the only character that in either one of my books uh, is based on a real person. Uh, the Bill Redpath uh, in, the, in The Hanging Judge is based on a man named Bill Homans, who I worked for, who was a chain smoker and a fabulous trial lawyer. And Bill Redpath is a chain smoker and a fabulous trial lawyer. He lawyer. sure is. Yeah. And I thought he did a quite an incredible job with his uh, client, yeah. to say the least. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about the one I judge. We're not going to have time to read from it, but sure. tell me a little bit about the Well, book. That, uh, the, the, the hang judge has to do with uh, this drive-by shooting and the death penalty case. Uh, in, in the hang judge, as you know now since you've finished it, yes. uh, the judge has a confrontation with... Uh, uh, a loopy pro se litigant, and as a result, he gets injured in the face. And no, don't reveal too much. Now. I don't want people to know too much. All I right, want them to uh, read it. Uh, but um, uh, he, uh, and so he has a, a trouble with uh, his vision. So he's right. known as the one-eyed judge oh, in the second book. That he gets that nickname from the bar. And in this uh, in this novel, the uh, prosecution focuses on a sort of entirely different context. It's a it's an Amherst College professor. Uh, in his late 60s, uh, who is, uh, specializes in uh, um, Charles Dodson, who wrote uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland under the pen name Lewis Carroll. Uh, and uh, he gets, uh, he's, he's at home one morning in the beginning of the novel, and there's a delivery to his house, a UPS delivery of what appears to be a DVD. Um, and uh, he takes it, and Pow! Uh, the FBI is coming through the door, wow. and the DVD is a uh, is a video containing really um, abhorrent child pornography, and he is charged with possession of uh, a receipt of child pornography, which carries a minimum mandatory five year sentence. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, did he really order it, right. or was he the victim of a setup? by a jealous colleague or a disgruntled student, uh, and we follow this prosecution in, in The One-Eyed Judge. It uh, takes place uh, to a very large extent in Amherst, right. and it involves a new defense attorney, a woman named Linda Ames, who I like very much as well. Okay. Huh. Well, Judge Ponder, this has been really fascinating, thank to you. say the least. Come I on. want to thank you for being on the My show. My pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Really great talking to you. Um, I wanted to thank Amherst Media for sponsoring Senior Moment. They've been really terrific. Uh, all the crew who does the camera work. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Faith Gregory, who is one of the producers of the show. She's been really helpful to me. Uh, I hope that you uh, tune in when um, uh, this episode is on the air, and I want to thank you for, uh, for viewing it. Thank you very much. Thank you.